Hey guys, it's David Warren. Thanks for stopping by. I am a travel nurse practitioner and I live in Dallas, Texas. I'm here today to talk to you about a day in the life of an ER nurse practitioner on a travel assignment. Unfortunately, I didn't bring the camera with me when I did this assignment, but I'm gonna detail all of my experiences for you about it. So I've received so many questions about what it's like being in Alaska and working in a remote location and I've told the story several times, so I'm gonna tell it now for everyone to watch. So I am a nurse practitioner and I live in Dallas, Texas. I worked full time here in Dallas for about two and a half years, starting in mid 2015 till about the end of 2017. And towards, I would say May, April or May of 2017, I decided that I really didn't want to have a full-time job anymore. I was just really burnt out on going to work. <laughs> no, it sounds terrible. I was really burnt out on going to work and I was just over it. And so I turned in my resignation and the particular area where I worked required 120 day notice, meaning that once I turned in my notice, I had to continue to work for 120 days to fulfill my contract. And so during that time, it really allowed me to figure out what I was going to do. I was kind of between the options of staying in Dallas or moving somewhere else or moving back to East Texas. I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I began looking into uh, being a travel nurse practitioner. I received all these notifications via email, Facebook, LinkedIn, wherever about uh, travel assignments as a nurse practitioner. And that really sparked my interest. And what really sparked my interest was one night I was laying in bed and kind of job searching. It was after I turned in my resignation and I came across an assignment in remote Alaska and it really just captured my attention. And it was through this uh, staffing company called Wilderness Medical Staffing. And it was, it's the people that I actually ended up working, the contracting through for my Alaska assignments. Um, but at this particular time, I was reading about these assignments in remote Alaska and they just sounded fascinating because they're literally in the middle of nowhere, you have no resources and you're out there and you're just kind of left to fend for yourself and it all sounded like a horrible situation. It sounded terrifying, so scary, yet it sounded so exhilarating going to a remote area like that and really making a difference and it's something that I really wanted to do. So I, I didn't turn in an application, but I, I emailed one of the recruiters and I just asked for a little more information about what it's like to work in these remote areas. And lo and behold, I got a call from the owner of the company. Her name's Mary Ellen. She's fabulous. She's a nurse practitioner and she's worked in all of these remote areas throughout Alaska. And she really like, laid it all out on the table for me as to what working in remote Alaska was really like because she's worked there before. And so she told me, she's like, you're probably gonna be, in some areas, you're probably gonna be the only provider. There may be a, like a health aide or a nurse or a medical assistant or somebody there to help you, but um, it's just a clinic and there's no, uh, there's no hospital. The closest hospital is miles away via medevac, which is a helicopter or an airplane that transports the patient. Um, yeah, it's, it's just out in the middle of nowhere and it's super remote. And she basically told me that you're, you're it. There's not, there's not a hospital. There's not an emergency room. It's a clinic. The clinic has some extra stabilization equipment, like some airway equipment. Um, some equipment to stabilize a, a patient that's uh, undergone like a trauma and there's just very minimal equipment but things you can use to stabilize a patient before you ship them out where you fly them out and after I got off the phone with Mary Ellen this was probably I would say April or May um, I was like I, I don't know if I can do that or not that just sounds terrifying but it sounds amazing at the same time and so I just kind of mulled it over. I thought about it for a while. And ultimately, after I turned in my resignation, I, I kept thinking on it for months, for weeks and months, and, and trying to decide, what am I gonna do? I looked into some other travel companies, uh, mainly travel companies with a hospital where they actually had an ER and some resources. Um, I looked into that, but that just didn't really sound as fun to me. I mean, it sounded way more fun to go to this remote area in the middle of nowhere and, you know, really have a good time. 
and um, that's kind of how I got started looking into traveling to remote Alaska. And so the next, they told me the next step would be you really need to get licensed. You got to get licensed in Alaska for this to actually work. And so I got licensed in Alaska. I started submitting my application. They're not part of the compact, so you have to get your RN license and your MP license. So I submitted everything for my RN license. You have to get fingerprinted. It's a paper application. It has to be notarized. There's like a checklist of all this crazy stuff you have to do. So I submitted everything for my RN license. Very hesitantly, I didn't know what was I thinking. So I submitted my application for my license. I got my RN license, you know, a couple months later, and then I got my MP license. I submitted applications for that. And then I called the company back, Wilderness Medical Staffing, and I said, hey, I'm licensed in Alaska. I literally have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm licensed in Alaska. And so they said, great, we'll start looking for you some travel assignments. And this was probably, I would say, July, August, when my license finally came through. And they're like, okay, let's, you know, let's start looking for you assignments. And so um, August, I don't remember the exact day, I wanna say August like 12th, 13th was my last day uh, of 2017. It was gonna be my last day in the ER here in Dallas. And um, on my last shift in the ER, I very vividly remember this, I did not have work set up. I, nothing had come through yet. They're like, hey, we'll continue to look for assignments. Nothing's come through yet. And so I very vividly remember on my last day driving to work thinking, what am I doing? I have no job lined up. I'm about to be jobless. I have like a car, I have rent, I have all, you know, crazy bills. What am I gonna do? And a couple weeks later, uh, one of the recruiters from Wilderness called me and said, hey, we've got two positions open, one in Haines, Alaska, and I'll show you on Google Maps where that's at. And the other was on Prince of Wales Island which is ultimately where I ended up going, Prince of Wales Island. So um, I had them submit me to both. I was like, hey, submit me to both. I'll, I'll go. I don't have a job right now, so I'll go anywhere. So they submitted me to both assignments and uh, the Haynes assignment shows a nurse practitioner that had like 20 something years of experience and worked in remote Alaska. And so I was like, that's a no brainer. Like obviously they're gonna choose that person. For the Prince of Wales assignment, they chose me and uh, they submitted me is basically what happens is you tell the recruiter hey i'm interested in this job you send the recruiter your cv or your resume and then the recruiter forwards it on to the client or the whoever you'll be working for and they review it and decide hey this person's a good fit or not so much and that, that's how you're chosen for these travel jobs and so they submitted my cv uh, over to the um, client to the hospital the clinic where i was going to be working and um, they said, yeah, we'll take him. And so the recruiter called me back a, a, like a week later and was like, hey, um, you've been accepted to the assignment on Prince of Wales Island. And I very vividly remember opening that email and seeing that I've been accepted on Prince of Wales Island. And then my heart sank because I was like, what have I done? Where am I going? I have no idea. I was terrified out of my mind. I didn't really show it, uh, maybe I did show it to some people, but I really tried to hide it because I didn't want people to see that I was scared, but on the inside, I was absolutely terrified as to what I was gonna be getting myself into. So I talked to Mary Ellen again, the owner of the company. I was like, hey, tell me about Prince of Wales Island. What did I sign up for? And she's like, okay, here's the deal. So you're gonna fly up to Prince of Wales Island. You'll take a plane from Dallas to Seattle, Seattle to Ketchikan. Ketchikan is down in Southeast Alaska. Um, it's probably one of the most southern parts of Alaska uh, on the southeast side. And then you take a little bush plane, which is like a little six-seater plane, over to this island. It's called Prince of Wales Island, and it's literally an island. It's about a 40, if I remember correctly, a 30-minute or an hour-long flight over to Prince of Wales, which is where I would be like residing for a period of time. And so uh, when I signed up for this assignment, I told them I, I want to go for like four to six weeks. I really don't want to go any longer than that. Like that's a good amount of time to get away, see if I like it. If I like it, I'll go back. So they said, okay. So you, I went for six weeks. It was a contract. And so uh, Mary Ellen was telling me all about the place you're going to take this bush plane. Um, there's no, uh, there's not an airport there. It's a landing strip, a uh, concrete landing strip. And there'll be somebody from the clinic waiting on you in a car. And that's where you'll, you know, get your, you have a clinic car, you'll get your car and then you'll be taken to where you're going to be staying. And so that brings up the uh, housing and travel arrangements. So 
I stayed in a nice house. It was like a two-story house out on the bay. Um, it was beautiful. You look out to this rocky bay and um, it's a harbor. There's boats everywhere, um, like the local fishermen. And it's the most, she portrayed this most like beautiful sight ever. And it actually ended up being amazing. And she said the clinic is, it is what it is, the clinic. It's maybe a, I don't know, 10 or 15 bed clinic, family practice clinic. There are a couple of nurse practitioners there and there's one physician there. And those people, uh, the full-time providers see the primary care patients. They see, um, you know, all the like scheduled visits and then they hire travelers to come in and do their walk-in clinic, which is like their urgent care slash ER, even though it's not an ER. Um, they have some extra equipment, as I said before. So they have like a crash cart, some airway equipment, uh, some stuff to like stabilize patients, IV equipment, IV antibiotics, just some basic stuff to really like help you if you're in an emergent situation. And so that was kind of the nature of the work. She said, you know, you won't be the only provider. However, uh, or at least during the day you won't, you'll have some other help, but you'll be doing the walk-in stuff. And then uh, at night, obviously the clinic's only open eight to five, at night, there's going to be a provider on call, meaning that you take a cell phone, like a cell phone, and uh, you take that home with you, and if there's an emergent situation at night, then you're called via that phone, and then a nurse will respond with you and uh, come to the clinic and evaluate the patient because it's not open all the time. So how that works is there's a triage line, and patients will call call up to the clinic and, they, and after hours they will be forwarded to this triage line and they'll talk to the triage nurse and tell them their basic symptoms or whatever's going on and the triage nurse via an algorithm will determine do they need to be seen now or can they wait and if they need to be seen now then the triage nurse will call you and say hey are you the provider on call i've got patient x y and z here with whatever they have with chest pain, they're not screening out via my algorithm, would you like to see them or what would you like to do? And at that point, you as a provider make the decision, yes, I would like to see the patient, um, let's uh, have them meet me at the clinic in 10 minutes. And so I would call the nurse that's on call with me and say, hey, we've got a patient coming in, let's go, we know they're going to meet us at the clinic in 10 minutes. And my first call back, I found it so important to ask, how long is it going to take the patient to get there? because some patients live an hour away and they have to drive in and sometimes you go to the clinic and you're waiting and waiting and nobody shows up for like an hour. So tip, if you travel to Alaska, ask the patient where they live so when they meet you there, you kind of arrive on time with each other. So that's how the after hours works. Um, the nurses are great. They all have fabulous experience in like emergency or ICU and so they're really good. Uh, but at night, you are the only provider. It's you and a nurse. And so whatever comes in, you've got to be prepared to deal with it. And um, that's kind of the situation at night, is it can get kind of shady, but thankfully I didn't really have anything crazy happen at night. Most of the calls that I got at night were between like 5 p.m. and 11 p.m. Uh, I didn't really get called out in the middle of the night very much, although I did some. So that's kind of how the night call situation works. It was a lot of fun. Um, I got a lot of sleep actually. I didn't, call, I didn't get called out a whole lot, um, but all of the providers at the clinic rotate call with each other. And so when you're at the clinic during the day, you're seeing the, you know, the walk-in, the urgent care type patients. Um, and again, whatever walks in, you, you have to deal with. Uh, they have very limited resources. So they have um, a CBC, which is a complete blood count, which measures like your hemoglobin, your hematocrit, your white blood cells. They have a chemistry panel, so it measures your electrolytes. They have a urinalysis, like a urine test. They have basic like strep and flu. Um, they have a few extra tests as well, so like a troponin um, to tell if you have like heart damage from a heart attack. Um, they have an EKG machine. They have basic x-ray. There's no CT. Um, so that presents a challenge when you're evaluating patients and they come in with um, they come in with abdominal pain or whatever. You have to really determine, does this patient need to be seen like right now? Can they, can they wait another day or do they need to go off the island for a CT scan? And so whenever somebody comes in with something emergent, then you have to uh, do what we call a medevac. It's like, I guess, a medical evacuation. And that's where a plane will come in, take the patient off the island to the hospital. Again, it's about a, I think, 30, to a 30 minute to an hour long flight to the actual hospital. And that's where they can go to the, to the ER and be evaluated. 
And so this is a little a bit of a unique situation, again, because it's Prince of Wales Island. It's an island. You can't drive off the island. The only way off the island is via ferry, which comes, I think, twice a day, or I can't remember, once or twice a day, or a plane. And that's the only way you're getting on or off the island. And so you really have to determine when you see these patients, do they need to go now, or can they wait maybe till tomorrow and get on one of the commercial bush plane flights? Or do they need to be medically evacuated via like a like a medevac helicopter or a medevac plane where there's like a nurse and a paramedic, like a flight crew. And so that's the challenge of working in remote Alaska. Um, the clinic was great. I love the people. Like my first day, I, um, I met the two nurse practitioners and the physician and they're just awesome people. Like you just really form quick relationships. And that's the cool thing about being a travel nurse practitioner is when you get there, you're expected to hit the ground running and you start seeing patients that same day. Um, apart from that, we would rotate call on the weekends, and um, when you were off a weekend, you could go out and explore. Had some amazing times hiking, uh, viewing sunsets, going up cool trails, kayaking with the whales. Uh, all of it was so amazing. I loved it. Even went snow camping at one point. Um, it was so fun. This was my first assignment, uh, first travel assignment that I completed, and I just absolutely fell in love. And they do have, I forgot to mention this earlier, they do have EMS traffic there. Very rarely, I, I say very rarely, when I was there, very rarely would EMS get called out, but they do have EMS. And so if you're on call at night and the EMS comes in, the EMS, uh, the paramedic will call you, be like, hey, I've got X, Y, and Z, I'm bringing them to the clinic. And so you'll just meet the paramedics at the clinic. Um, it's a bit of a scary situation medicine-wise. You really have to function independently. I mean, when, uh, when you're there during the day, you have some helping bounce ideas off people. Uh, but at night, you're, I mean, you're really the only person. You gotta be ready to deal with whatever walks through the door. So you have to be very comfortable with anything, primary care to urgent care to true emergency medicine. Um, putting breathing tubes down, you know, putting a breathing tube down people's throats to breathe for them, putting a chest tube in to relieve a collapsed lung. I mean, whatever, ha you just gotta be prepared for anything that comes through the door. I met some of the most amazing people traveling in Alaska. I, I had hands down one of the best experiences I've ever had. I loved it so much that I went back a second time in April of 2018, stayed for a month. Um, and it's really cool whenever you're gone for like six months and you come back and you get to like reconnect with these people and you see them again and you know, your friends on Facebook and you keep up with each other and you see each other again. It's just it's a really cool dynamic, um, you know, to be able to do that. And so that's my experience being a travel nurse practitioner working in remote Alaska, working in Bush, Alaska, uh, practicing true wilderness medicine. I mean, it's, it's fabulous. Uh, not too many people get to do it, uh, but I'm so thankful for those opportunities. I've learned so much. The medicine was amazing. I had just a, a perfect time, and uh, I'll definitely go back again. So thanks for watching. If you've ever been to Alaska, comment below. Tell me where you've been, what you've enjoyed, and if you could go back, where would you go again? So thanks for watching my video. That's in a nutshell what remote Alaska is like. So if you have any questions, comment below, let me know. I, I would be more than happy to answer them for you. I mean, if you're interested in traveling to Alaska, I can hook you up with the right people. So again, thanks for watching. Have a good day.